Welcome to Preaching That Matters. A place you can find apostolic Pentecostal preaching. A place where all generations can be fed with the Word of God. We hope you enjoy. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, Amen. Before you're seated, I would like to turn, uh, turn your attention to the book of Ephesians, chapter number 1. And we will begin reading with verse number 1. And I have been uh, feeling to go to uh, this book for a little while. This is a beautiful book, the book of Ephesians. <laughs> and uh, this will probably be uh, something of a series. We will see how long it goes. Um, but something as, uh, that's uh, becoming more and more real to me is the, is the, the, uh, the beauty and the power of just uh, expository teaching from the Word of God, just taking a book verse by verse and letting the Word of God speak to us in the way that God gave it. Aren't you thankful for your Bible? Aren't you thankful for the Word of God? Amen, amen. So we're going to be doing a study the book of Ephesians. I don't know how long we'll go. We'll just kind of see how far we get today, and that'll help us figure that out. Ephesians 1, and verse number 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, to the saints which are at Ephesus, and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. One more scripture, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, <clears throat> that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Amen. Thankful for the word of God today. Amen. We're going to pray over this. Also, let's, I would like us to pray for uh, uh, little Noah Torado. And uh, this is Brother Danny, Sister Sabrina's son, Sister uh, Denise's grandson. He's just very sick with the flu, high fever. And I uh, just want to pray for him. Of course, those that are sick with the flu, pray for all of them as well. And to pray that God would bless his word today. Let's pray together. Jesus, we love you. God, we thank you. We're in your house and with the great, great people of God. So excited to be serving you today. Lord, we pray for all those that are sick. We pray for Noah Torado. Touch this young man in his body. In Jesus' name, let healing virtue flow. And Lord, we ask that you would bless your people. Your word is already blessed, that you would speak it to our hearts and minds. We give you praise and glory. In Jesus' name, we pray. Again, everyone said amen. Amen. And God bless you. You can be seated in Jesus' name. I want to begin um, with the first verse of this book of Ephesians. I will not give much of a background as far as uh, timing that was written, um, but suffice it to say this, is, of course, was one of the <clears throat> uh, 13, possibly 14 epistles of the Apostle Paul. This is one of his uh, prison epistles. And uh, a letter, a letter, an epistle, of course, means letter, that was written uh, to the church at Ephesus and to a broader audience that we will talk about in just a moment. The Bible says in verse number one that Paul was an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. And I want to begin by telling you today that I am very, very interested, as I know this congregation is today, I'm very interested in, in finding the will of God. I am interested in the will of God uh, for this body of, of believers, this local church. And I tell you, we, we, uh, we have to be in his will. 
The will of God, I, I look at it like a, a river that is flowing, and it is flowing fast, it is flowing deep, and uh, it is powerful. And the question is not whether or not God has a will for this church. The question is, are we in the will of God? And I would just encourage every man, woman, and child in this place today to jump into the river of the will of God. It runs fast, and it runs wide, and it runs deep. But I'm going to tell you, there is no safer place in all of this world than to know that you are doing the perfect will of God. I want the will of God in this church. I want it in my life, and I want it for every individual in this place. And the good news is the will of God is not some kind of elusive thing that cannot be found. The will of God is, is available for us. In fact, uh, finding the will of God, I think sometimes we make it a mystery. It's like, I wonder what God's got for us, and especially Maybe some of you that are, are younger here today, maybe um, young people, young couples, um, singles that are in this room here today, uh, in pursuit of uh, the will of God for the rest of your life. Uh, but I would say that it's not just for that group, it's for everybody in this place. We're all, in a certain sense, desperate for the will of God. But if we're not careful, we'll think of it as some kind of mystery. It's like God has a plan for my life, but I wonder what it is. I remember as a teenager, uh, you know, I, when I got about 18 years of age, I remember um, you're old enough now, uh, at least uh, chronologically, you know, to move out of the house. And is it time to get out and, and uh, to do that? It's, it's certainly time to get life together and, and, and pray God that you're that you have, uh, uh, your, your, your character has been formed, your work ethic has been formed, um, your, your basic nature has been formed to the extent that you can begin uh, that process. And uh, it's time now to, to, to take it to another level. And I remember uh, enrolling in college, and uh, I was... I was uh, 18 years of age, enrolling at um, the school up in San Luis Obispo there. And uh, one of the first questions they would ask is, what, what is your major going to be? You, have to, you can't have an undeclared major. In other words, you're 18, what are you going to do with the rest of your life? And I remember thinking, yeah, it's, that's, why, yeah that's what I want to know too. <laughs> and um, putting something down, I remember, uh, you know, and sometimes you... you, you, you uh, uh, young people state uh, their goals or, or their uh, intended occupation based on strange things, weird things. Well, I, I liked math. That math, I just enjoyed it. And, and, uh, and so I'm thinking, well, you know, obviously I'm supposed to be an engineer, you know. And, of course, I couldn't change the oil in my car. So I, uh, I enrolled. I was, a, I, I was accepted at Cal Poly as a, uh, my first major. I think it was uh, industrial engineering. And... Uh, God had mercy on the, the field of industrial engineering when he called me to be a preacher. Amen. And uh, so I, I was doing that for a while, and really it's just general ed stuff and, and uh, thinking of civil engineering. And, and uh, eventually just way led to way, and, and, and God in his mercy began to teach me about his will. I began to find out that uh, God is, 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 is interested, in fact, he is more interested in us being in his will than we are. And if we will just do the micro, he will do the macro. If we will do the small things, he will lead and guide us into the large things. You've heard it said uh, that the present duty, and if you haven't heard this before, I would recommend you memorize this burn it on the, uh, on, in your memory bank somewhere, write it down. Uh, but you've heard it said that the present duty is the will of God. Now, if you've not heard that before, I want to make sure you understand that. Sometimes we wonder, you know, again, where, where do I go to find the will of God? What do I do to find the will of God? I tell young people this all the time that are kind of trying to find out future occupation and spouse and life. And I, I tell them the present duty is the will of God. What that means is when you wake up in the morning, what lies in front of you, the duty that is present, 
the thing that God has laid in your lap today, the things that you're supposed to do when you, and if you don't have anything that you're supposed to do, well, you might want to, that'd be the first will of God is find out something profitable and get going. And, uh, and uh, if, you're, if you're young and of that age, uh, a job would be a great place to start. Amen. I heard somebody preaching on Holy Ghost Radio on the way here today. They, they were talking about why nobody wants to read the book of Job because they think it's the book of Job. And, and so they move on to Psalms. Amen. But can I tell you, start with a, 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 what you know to do, the present duty. And so today, when you woke up, your job, your duty, the will of God for your life, as you got out of bed, uh, was probably to get up and brush your teeth and take a shower. That was, that was literally part of the will of God for your life. To get dressed, to get your family ready, to get in your car, and to drive to the house of God, and to sit where you're sitting can I tell you, if you are tormented, am I in the will of God? Am I in the will of God? What am I supposed to be doing today? What am I supposed to be doing today? Can I make somebody feel really good? If you're in this house listening to the word of the Lord today, very likely there may be an exception somewhere that I can't imagine, but you are in the will of God. Now, I don't know about you, but that comforts me. There's a scripture that says the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. There's times that as I'm praying in the sanctuary, I'll put a step in front of me, and I'll say, oh, God, you just ordered that step. I am in the will of God. As I'm walking through the sanctuary praying, and I, I'm just telling you, there is something so comforting knowing that, watch this, Jesus, my next step, I'm in the will and the plan of God. If you're in his house today hearing his word, there ought to be a comfort in your spirit that says, I'm in his will today. I'm in his house today. I am in the perfect plan and will of God. I think somebody ought to rejoice in the fact that God has a perfect plan for your life. It runs fast, it runs wide, it runs deep, and you are in the will of God. I think we ought to lift our hands and thank God for his will today. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. I love you, I love you, Jesus. Amen, amen. So the will of God is, is available for us. Do the will of God that's in front of you. When you leave this place today, do what's in front of you. Tomorrow, wake up, go to work. Tell people about Jesus. Live for God. Be faithful. Pray. Read your Bible. Do the will of God. This is part of, this is a theme throughout Ephesians 1. Ephesians 1 verse 5 talks about the good pleasure of his will. Everybody say his will. His will. Verse number 9. It talks about having made known unto us the mystery of his will. His will. Verse number 11 talks about <clears throat> Uh, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. I want to tell you, God has a will for your life. And if you're sitting here hearing the word of God today, very likely you're in the will of God. Continue in his will and let the present duty be the will of God for you. And everybody said amen. And so Paul, this apostle, and you could read the backstory of his life, how he that was uh, so trained in the scriptures. He was, as he said in the book of Philippians, he talked about he was a Hebrew of the Hebrews. He was a Jew that knew the scripture. He was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. He was of the tribe of Benjamin. He knew the law. He had sat at the feet of Gamaliel. He was zealous of the law. But there came a point where God uh, revealed to him this man that was so seeped in Jewish law that he, he persecuted anybody that was not uh, of the Jewish faith, especially Jews that were, that were now receiving this new revelation of Jesus, of Christ, of the Messiah. And he would persecute them and, 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 and go into their house and, and take them and, and, uh, in an effort to, uh, to somehow to get them to, uh, to deny the faith of Jesus Christ. And we all know that how on the, the road of Damascus, there was a light that knocked him to his face. And he's laying there in the road, this brilliant man seeped, uh, saturated <clears throat> in the word, the Old Testament doctrine, the law. And this man that knew who Jehovah God was, he thought, that knew the word of God, he thought. And he lays there in the dust knowing, I've never had an experience like this in my life, but he knows that it is God that's doing it. And he asks this question. He lifts his head up. I wonder if he was kind of afraid of what he would hear. And he says, who are you, Lord? 
The only Lord he had was Jehovah. The only Lord that he would know to ask that question of was the Jehovah God of the Old Testament. That's who he was addressing. Who art thou, Lord? And the Bible says in Acts 9 that he's, the Lord said, I am Jesus. Can I just stop and tell somebody today that if you're wondering who God is, the answer is still the same. He is Jesus. If you're here today and you're, you've, you've, maybe the life has knocked you to the road down on your face, you got dust in your teeth, dirt in your teeth, the grit in your mouth, and you're wondering what the next step is, you're lifted your eyes up enough to be in this house today and say, God, who are you? What is your will? What's your plan? I'm going to tell you the answer is still the same. He is Jesus. He is Jesus. He is Jesus. And he's in this place to save somebody today. And Paul becomes an apostle. Paul becomes an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. And this man begins one of the most interesting life careers of anybody you'll ever read about in the world. And he, 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 he is writing here a book that we're going to study, the book of Ephesians. He does tell us in this first verse who his audience is. We read it already. He says, I'm writing this uh, to the saints which are at Ephesus. And uh, some of you, um, a few years ago, I, 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 it's terrible that I can't remember, but uh, we're, we're privileged to go uh, with my dad and I. Um, and on a, on a trip, we went to the uh, seven churches of Asia, basically uh, Asia Minor, which is Turkey. And uh, this is um, the seven churches that are listed in the book of Revelation, um, chapter 1, I believe it's verse number 8. Um, and, he, and, and John is writing uh, to Ephesus and Smyrna and Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis and Philadelphia and Laodicea. He's writing to these churches. Ephesus is one of those seven churches. And if you ever go to, to Turkey, if you ever go there um, and, uh, uh, and you go to Ephesus, they, somebody described Ephesus as like the Disneyland of the archaeological world. In other words, it's the most impressive archaeological ruins uh, perhaps in the world, with maybe a couple of exceptions. I'll never forget, they had said it was going to be a really neat day. We're going to Ephesus, and we had been to a couple of other places, and it was neat. It was impressive. They were large. Uh, but, but I'll never forget when we were walking down the road and you turn uh, down this road uh, to the right, there's some old ruins and you're literally walking uh, very likely where Paul walked in Acts chapter, uh, Acts chapter number 20 when the Bible says there was a riot at Ephesus and the whole Ephesian city is screaming with, with, with Paul in the background, probably 2,000 people. There's a theater there that still to this day stands. It's full, and, and Paul has preached about the one true God. Because of that, people are not buying idols, and the silver indus, silversmith industry is, is going to ruin. And I, I can imagine you're there, you're, 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 and you're hearing 2,000 people minimum screaming, great is Diana of the Ephesians. They're just chanting at the top of their lungs while Paul, this little man that has caused this riot, stands there thinking about how powerful God is. He doesn't seem to be cowed at all. Anyway, you're walking down this street, and uh, it, it does, a, it does a, a turn. You do a right angle and then a left turn again, and that's really the street where they believe Demetrius and the silversmiths were. The, the stadium would be behind you at that point. But you're walking down that first street, and you get to the corner, and you look up, and there is one of the most impressive uh, ruins, archaeological ruins you'd ever see in your life. And it is the, the library at Ephesus. The library at Ephesus. You can, you can look it up, look it up online, and it's, it's, it's unbelievable. And it is to this group of saints that Paul is writing to in Ephesians, uh, the book of Ephesians. He's writing to a church that was formed here. He writes to the saints which are at Ephesus. But it's not just to the saints at Ephesus. The Bible says that he is also writing to the faithful. The faithful. Everybody say the faithful. He is writing to the faithful in Christ Jesus. And so this book is not just to a local church. It is to all the faithful in Christ Jesus. And I understand that 
uh, probably that, if, that, you know, in a larger sense, this is just referring to all of the saved. This is referring to those that are saved in Christ. But I don't think I'm doing damage to the scripture to tell you that there are special blessings on people that are faithful in living for God. There are special blessings upon people that are faithful. The Bible actually asks in the book of Proverbs, it talks about there's a lot of people that will proclaim their own greatness. You ever met somebody like that? Don't raise your hand. Somebody that was willing to tell you how good they are at what they do and, and how capable they are and how to fix stuff and, and especially fix other people's problems and, and they're ready to stop in and, and help you with that. A faithful, it, it talks about everybody's willing to proclaim their own greatness. But then it asks a question and it says, but a faithful man who can find? Can I tell you one of the most rare and when you find it special commodities in the world is somebody that is faithful. I want to say thank you to the faithful saints of God that are in this house today. I want, in, in fact, it, it's, not, it's not just coming from your pastor, although I say it sincerely, thank you for being faithful. Thank you for praying. Thank you for being here in the house of God today. Thank you for the fact that I know you're going to be here tonight. Thank you for being faithful to the Wednesday night service. Thank you to the faithful saints of God that give and support the work of God, that work around the, the church, that, that bring people to the house of God. I thank you on a personal level from your pastor. I thank you for being faithful in Christ Jesus. But I believe it's the will of God for these words that are in the scripture somehow to flow through his man today to you. There's a God that's thankful, that is thankful for you being faithful. The thankfulness of God for faithful saints of God. And I would say that God gives special blessings to faithful saints of God. I believe we're all blessed just to be saved. But I want to tell you, there's a special, a special blessing to the faithful. In fact, some of you know in the book of John chapter number 2, the Bible says that this is the miracle, the first miracle that Jesus did. How many know what he did? He turned water into wine. The Bible says they're there at the, the, uh, the wedding and Jesus' mother comes to him and says, Jesus, we got a problem. We have a problem and we have no wine. Jesus looks at her and it's almost, well, it, it seems rude when you read it. He says, woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. Mary doesn't get discouraged. She just says, that's all right. And the Bible says she slipped over to the servants and she said, listen, guys, whatever he tells you to do, you do it. Now, that's good advice. Whatever Jesus tells you to do, no matter how silly it is, no matter if we need wine and he tells you to fill the pots with water, if he tells you to do something, you just nod your head, say, yes, sir, and do it because there's a blessing to being faithful. And the Bible says that these servants, we don't even know who they are. They're anonymous. It's funny how many times in Scripture the anonymous people of Scripture are getting things done. Can I tell you it's funny how many times in church the anonymous saints of God, they may not be standing up, their name may not be in lights, we may not thank them every Sunday, but the reason this is happening today, the reason people are going to be touched and healed and blessed and delivered and saved in this house today is because there are faithful saints of God, the anonymous, that say, I want to do the work and will of God. And these servants said, all right. And a few minutes later, Jesus tells them to do something so weird. He says, you see those pots over there? Yes, sir. Those servants weren't done. They knew what the need was. They knew they needed wine. But the Bible says that Jesus told those, serpent, those servants, not serpents, those servants, take the pots, take them to the well, and fill them with water. After they did that, the Bible says that they took, and then Jesus says, take those pots Give a drink to the governor of the feast. This is the guy in charge of the feast. So they take it to him, and I imagine he said, what's this? And they said, well, just drink it. Why? Well, just, I'm, because we're following orders. <laughs> just drink it. And, and he reaches down in there. What an interesting moment it must have been when he brought that goblet, that cup of water to his lips. You got to seize the moment and drink whenever you can. He puts it to his lips, and the Bible says he smacked his lips and said, Man, mm, that's the best wine I've ever had in my life. Where did you get that? And the Bible says nobody knew where the wine came from except for one select faithful group of people. Who knows who it was? The Bible says the servants which drew the water knew. 
Now, I'm going to tell you today to the faithful saints of God. There are some people that come to church, and I'm not putting them down, but they come to church, and they're just, woo, this is wonderful. Wow, the power of God's here. Did you see how many people got the Holy Ghost? Look at so-and-so shouting around the church. And the preaching goes forth and people are fed and helped and delivered. There's power of God in the altar call and everybody's shouting and rejoicing. And some are just saying, wow, this is awesome. Isn't God good? Wonder where that came from. But there's some servants in the house which have been drawing some water. There's some people in the house that have been praying faithfully throughout the week. There's some mamas that when they drop off their kids at the Lighthouse Christian Academy, they drop them off and then they slide into the church and, and, and they come in here and they kneel and they weep and they cry and they pray the glory down. There's some saints of God that come to pre-service prayer and they bow the knee and they lift their voice and they begin to talk to God. And when the glory of God falls on our services, there are some faithful servants which know why the wine of his spirit is here. I'm going to tell you, thank God for faithful people. Anybody glad to be a child of God today? And is there anybody that wants to be faithful in the kingdom of God? Amen. And so this book is written to the faithful in Christ Jesus. I want to say there's a special blessing on faithful people. One of them is the book of Ephesians. That's what he said. I'm writing this book to the faithful in Christ Jesus. Now, everybody can read it. You can be an atheist and read it, but I, I really believe the select audience. I mean, the Bible says it is to the saints which are at Ephesus. And unfortunately, there's not a lot there now that I know of. But there are a lot of faithful in Christ Jesus. This is a blessing that comes from God. Anybody thankful for the word of God today? I'm going to tell you, there is power in the word. One of the greatest blessings you will ever have is found in this scripture right here. I remember asking some saints a while back, talking to, to some saints in the church and asking them about times when the word of God spoke to them. Because there are times when you really need a word from God. I remember talking to my mother-in-law, Sister Marcella Thomas, and... and uh, I've, I, I've known this story, but I, I, I like to hear about it. When my, when my wife was, was a small child, she was diagnosed with rheumatic fever. And uh, Sister Erica Booker, your pastor's wife, uh, that's a bad deal, folks. It's a bad deal. She couldn't even walk. And they would have to carry her. And they, this went on for months and maybe even years where they would have to go to the doctor. And uh, we went a few years ago to the um, there's a certain uh, area for, for pediatrics at Loma Linda, and we had to take one of my children, my, my, uh, my wife, I think we were taking Trent, and this has been years ago, we went in there, and she was like, it was like all these memories came flooding back. She'd have to go often, was it weekly or monthly or monthly? She'd have to go, and they were, there was procedures, shots, or whatever the case was that they would have to do. And, uh, and uh, they would go to the doctor, and and, uh, and uh, if I got it right, there was a, there came a time when the bill was presented. Can you imagine how much, you know, it would cost to take a child over and over with this kind of disease and all the treatments that were involved? And, uh, and when the bill was presented, apparently the insurance agent had forgotten to add Erica to her parents' insurance. Is that right? That's bad news. And, and there was thousands of dollars, and, and, uh, and uh, so they, just money that they could not pay, did not have. And she, Sister Marcella and uh, Brother Thurman, whoever it was, began, they put together a, an application. It was called uh, to the CCS, Crippled Children's Society, and uh, basically asking for some kind of assistance to help with this, this, this monumental, huge uh, uh, bill that they, they could not afford. And one day, Sister Marcella, was, was, who is a faithful saint of God, she was praying. She began to cry. She began to weep, tears running down her face. And she sat down at, 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 with her Bible, and she said, God, listen, you know where I'm at. You know what I'm facing. I've got to have you talk to me out of your word. I'm going to tell you, there's, we always need the word, but there's a moment. There's times, <laughs> oh, God, we got to hear a word from God. She opened her Bible, and this was the verse with tears running down her face that she read from Psalm 28, 
verse 1 and then verses 6 and 7. It says, Unto thee will I cry, O Lord, my rock, be not silent to me, lest if thou be silent to me, I become like them that go down into the pit. And then it says, Blessed be the Lord, because he hath heard the voice of my supplications. Are you glad he's heard my, my prayer? The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusted in him, and I am helped. Therefore, my heart greatly rejoiceth, and with my song will I praise him. She, she, she shut her Bible and said, that's from God. I received the word of the Lord. Not too long after, CCS sent them a letter, said they had accepted Erica and began to pay huge bills. At one time, Sister Marcella said one bill alone, this is back in the early 80s, one bill alone was $10,000 plus. She took it to CCS, and the lady said, we've already paid that. I'm here to tell you, we serve a God that knows how to bless the faithful. He knows how to bless. One of the greatest blessings you'll ever have, faithful saint of God, is this Bible right here. I'm going to tell you, there is a blessing, and it is written to the faithful in Christ Jesus. Amen. Now, she was, my wife was treated from this rheumatic fever. I just, this is too good not to tell. But they knew if you have rheumatic fever, you, you're going to have heart murmurs. It's just what happens to kids that have rheumatic fever. And uh, they, they did tests. And uh, let, me, let me tell this. Year, years later, I just heard my wife kind of, I heard out of the corner of, uh, or just kind of, uh, just kind of listening in the other night, she was telling this to somebody at the house, maybe my Aunt Randy, I believe. She went years later to the doctor, and they, you know, they were asking, they said, hey, I see you have rheumatic fever, and, uh, and so tell me about your heart murmurs. And uh, she told the doctor, she said, I don't have heart murmurs. The doctor said, ma'am, if you have rheumatic fever, you, you do. It's just, it's just what it does. She said, no, I don't. Yes, you do. <laughs> no, I don't. Yes, you do. No, I don't. God healed me of that. And he said, you know, just kind of smiled that patronizing, you know, <laughs> yeah, I've got, I've got, you know, all eight years of medical school and $100,000 in debt to prove it. What do you, who are you to tell me? And he said, well, we'll do some tests. He did some tests and he came back and his words were something like, you know, you're very lucky. <laughs> no, no, I'm not lucky. I'm blessed. She didn't have any heart murmurs. God had healed her completely of that. And the miracle is bigger than that. We could tell you about it. I'm just here to tell you, there's a blessing to being faithful in Christ Jesus. There is a blessing. Church, don't get tired of being faithful. Don't get tired of coming to the house of God. Let me say that again. Don't get tired of being faithful in Christ Jesus. One of the biggest tools of the devil is to try to pluck the faithful out. But man, just stay anchored in. Get plugged in. Pray fast. Uh, be involved in the work of God. Be involved in church. Find something to do. And whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your might. Don't let anybody pull you away from the thing that God has called you to do. Amen, amen. There are some of you that are anointed to do the work of God. I was talking to a dear sister in this church. I told her, uh, you can read it in your Bible. The first person that was anointed of God was not a preacher or a prophet. The first one that it actually talks about being anointed, if I got his name right, was Barzillai. It was a man that was anointed to build the tabernacle. There are people in this church that are as anointed in a different way. There's different kinds of anointing, but, but there's an anointing to do the work of God, to work in the kingdom. Kingdom, uh, to put your, to use talents and abilities that God has have that has given you and the devil wants to pull you away but don't stop don't give up keep coming and working whatever your hand finds to do do it with your might as unto the Lord amen amen and, and I will tell you there are seasons in living for God there are seasons even in your work if you're a Bible study teacher you need to know this there are seasons where it goes better than others, okay, at least by our definition. But you don't know what God is doing. You don't know who God's stirring. There's been times I've had, I, right now I've got a list of about 15 people I'm, I'm working on, trying to get Bible studies with. About, I think I had six or seven this last week that I actually got to teach. And, uh, and so it's a, it's a good season. I want to have 20 a week. I want to have 20 a week. I want to have 20 a week. I think I can do that and still be effective in the other things. I want to have 20 a week. But I'm going to tell you, there's times when they dry up, and I get cancellation after cancellation, and you have too. But that doesn't mean you stop teaching Bible studies. That doesn't mean you stop praying about Bible studies. 
that doesn't mean you don't stop looking for Bible studies. And that doesn't mean that Bible studies don't work. They do work. Keep on being faithful. The Bible says, and let us not be weary in well-doing. For in due season, we shall reap if we faint not. You know what the test is? The test is don't get tired and don't quit. Just keep on reaching. And there's a mighty God in heaven that knows how to bless the faithful. I think we ought to lift our hands and thank God for his goodness today. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Amen, amen. There is faithful people that are blessed of God. Paul says that to these faithful in Christ Jesus, there is grace and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Anybody thankful for grace and peace today? Paul says it's from God our Father and, uh, excuse me, and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Now I want you to, I want to just stop and say something here. This, this salutation of Paul, he does this in many of his epistles. I remember when I was in Bible quizzing, one year we learned Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians. And every one of them has this salutation and every one of the salutations is slightly different. Those of you that know Bible quizzing, you understand that's confusing. I mean, like, in some places it'll have an and, in some places it'll have a the, and the other one won't have it. And so you got to remember four that are slightly different. It's worse than learning four completely different, trust me. But I, I, this, that had nothing to do with anything. I just thought I'd tell you that. But this has something to do with something, and that is the fact in his salutation, it talks about God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Often people get hung up on that, and they want to try to make dual persons in God. They want to see God as more than one. They want to see God as more, uh, as more than a single uh, person in the Godhead. But it's interesting to me that while they would do that with verse 2, they never do it with the verse number 3. Look at verse number 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Did you catch that? If you're going to use that kind of thinking, then God and Father are two separates. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. If in verse 2, Father and, and Christ are separate because they have a, a conjunction and in between them, then in verse number 3, when it talks about God and Father, God and Father are separate because they have a conjunction and between them. You don't end up with three in the Trinity, you end up with four in the Trinity. What I'm just trying to say here is this and does not mean separate center of consciousness or more than one. It just is revealing about who he is. Any more than saying I'm a father and I'm a son and I'm your pastor. That's not three people. My name is Joel Booker. Jesus is the Father, He is the Son, He is the Holy Ghost. All these three are one. All these three are one. Amen. That's why the Bible says that in Jesus dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Jesus is not part of the Godhead. The Godhead, he's not part of the Godhead. He's not in the Godhead, but the Bible says the Godhead is in Jesus. The fullness dwells in him. When you see Jesus, you see the invisible God of the Old Testament that could not suffer, that could not bleed, that could not die, that could not get tired or thirsty. But the God of the Old Testament said, I got a problem on my hands my creation the people that i created have sinned they need salvation and i've sent preachers and prophets and they stoned the preachers and they killed the prophets i gave them my law they couldn't keep the law everything i've tried they've somehow made a way to fail what i will do now is i will come myself and you that have sinned and it's all of us and the wages of sin is death and we can't die one for another because we've all got our own record wouldn't it be nice if there was somebody innocent that had never sinned that could take our place that's what God did. The Bible said, God, who at sundry times and in diverse manner spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, 
He said, I'll come myself. And he caused Mary, a virgin, to be with child. And that which was conceived in her was of the Holy Ghost. When you saw Jesus, you saw the image of the invisible God. And now the invisible God was visible. And now the God that had no body had a body. And now a God that didn't have flesh and blood couldn't die, couldn't shed blood. Now he could lay himself down on a cross and die for our sins. I'm here to tell you, I'm thankful I know who Jesus is. Amen, amen. Let's see if I can get my arm tucked up in here. Anybody ever seen this? Amen. The invisible God of the Old Testament. You can't see him. He's invisible. The Bible says he does not have flesh and blood. He does not have bones. He doesn't have a body. But the Bible says in John 1 and 1, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God and the Word was God. That Word was the thought of God, the manifestation of God, the creative power of God. But verse number 14 says that Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And I'm glad when I read the salutations of Paul and the different places, these are biblical. Don't duck and run, one God apostolic. Don't hang your head in shame. Stand up and say, I know who Jesus is. He is Father and Son. He is Holy Spirit. The Father, hallelujah, He is our Father. He's the Father of all creation. He was the Father in the sense that literally the Son was born and begotten. He is the Son in redemption. Literally, these are terms we need to embrace. It's who He is, and He is the Holy Spirit. Spirit that came back and filled them on the day of Pentecost and then filled Joel Booker on October 7, 1982 when I got the Holy Ghost speaking in other tongues. Jesus is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen, amen. And so when I learned Galatians 1 and 2 and Ephesians 1 and 2 and Philippians 1 and 1 or 2 or 3 and Colossians 1 and 1 and 2 and Paul is saying, Grace be to you and peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. You know what I do with those verses? I say, yes, that's exactly right. And doesn't mean there's more than one. And is talking about who he is and the roles that he plays. One God manifest in flesh. Aren't you glad you know who Jesus is today? Amen. I'll just throw this in there. You could even do this it, it, using that. Lo it's faulty logic to say because there's and. We're talking about more than one in the sense of literal persons there's actually a verse in the book of revelation that talks about the devil talks about the devil being the great satan the satan and 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 that great serpent the devil and the devil you use that and you've got an unholy trinity three persons in the unholy trinity i think it's the devil and satan and the and the serpent i'm gonna just tell you <laughs> those three are one too all right and they ain't worth messing with. But, but I'm here to tell you, Jesus is the name that we're baptized in. It's all about Jesus. Aren't you glad you know who he is today? And so Paul continues and he says, Blessed be the God and Father. And I love this verse of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us. Everybody say, he's blessed me. He's blessed me. He has blessed us. Listen to this. With all, I'm pausing dramatically. The nodding off people are going, huh? Oh, yeah. It's quiet in here. All right. Hey, Amen. You ever hear the story about the guy that was, this, this, something like this really happened. He was nodding off in church and, and uh, there was a, a silence and, and uh, he, he kind of woke up and his son said, Hey, the preacher wants you to stand and pray. So he stands up and starts praying out loud. Yeah. Okay. I'm giving you a moment here, dramatic pause. He has blessed us. Everybody say, blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Church, that's a good deal. Did you hear that? God has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. I brought this big old Bible up here today because it's a, it's a, it's a cool all Bibles are cool. This is a kind of a neat one. It's, it has 26 translations in one, okay? And, and so it'll, it'll, it'll kind of give on a verse different, different translations, maybe two or three, sometimes more of the verse. Let me read this to you 
from some other versions, who hath blessed us on high with every spiritual blessings in Christ, who has crowned us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms in Christ. He has blessed us with every spiritual blessing higher than heaven itself. I like this one. He has blessed us with spiritual blessings, all the spiritual blessings that heaven itself enjoys. I'm here to tell some people today, we are a blessed people of God. And part of those blessings, let me just roll through them very quickly. We don't have a lot of time here. But the Bible says he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. Did you catch that? The Bible says before he even laid the foundation of the world, he chose you. Some of you that are having an identity crisis, I don't care if you're 18 or you're 40 and, 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 you're, and you're, or you're 60 and you're having a midlife crisis where, I don't even know when you're supposed to have those. But uh, I'm 43, am I, am, I supposed, is, am I supposed to have one? I haven't had it yet. So um, can I tell you, whatever age you are, I got good news for somebody today. God chose you before he even made the world. Now do the math. That don't work. That's before you were born. <laughs> Not even before you were born. It's before there was a world for you to be born into. Before there was even a mama. Your mama was ever even around. There was a God that had chosen you. He said, I want that one right there. I want that one right there. I'm here to tell somebody today, we are blessed. We are blessed in all spiritual blessings in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And he's called us and chosen us that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. He goes on to say, we has predestinated us. This word predestinated, man, it's five. I got four minutes to teach on predestination, which I don't believe in the doctrine of predestination. How am I going to do that? Let me just tell you this. He has predestinated the church. There's going to be a church. The saints of God, there's going to be a church. I went to Ephesus, and all I saw was a library. I went to Ephesus, and, and I know there's probably people that are saved there, but I'm going to tell you, while Ephesus may not be a thriving apostolic church today, I'm telling you, the church has never been more powerful, more vibrant, more numerous, more power, more strength. You look around the North American church, sometimes you can get a little depressed. Can I tell you, revival is happening all around this world. Hey, man, this is as good a time to tell you as any. I just got a text yesterday from uh, Brother Nelsino's sister Catherine. They baptized another couple in Jesus' name. The couple they just baptized, uh, Jackson and Gabriella. Jackson, him, he's brand new. He said, I got a friend, and, and uh, he's wanting to know about this. What do I do? And, and they basically just tell him about it. So he went and taught a Bible study. He doesn't even have the Holy Ghost yet. He's seeking the Holy Ghost. And, and this new couple, uh, they, they both saw the need to be baptized in Jesus' name, uh, saw the oneness of God, and were baptized yesterday uh, in, in Jesus' name. <laughs> Gabriella. Jackson's wife, she, uh, uh, Sister Catherine, said, we need to be praying about this. Her, her brother is some kind of preacher. I don't know what kind of preacher, but in, in some kind of denominational Trinitarian type deal. And uh, she talked, got on the phone and started telling him. And he saw the oneness. He saw his need to be baptized in Jesus' name. We just need to pray God finishes the work. My, my point is to tell you, God's going to have a church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. The question is, are you going to be a part of it? He chose you before the foundation of the world. What's your choice going to be? He chose you before your mama even knew your name. What's your answer going to be? He said, I want you. Will you be a part of this? Is there anybody that will say, I want to be a part of the kingdom of God? <laughs> Musicians come today. I am almost done. He's predestinated unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself. We'll have to touch on that a little deeper. But I only got two minutes. According to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. Verse 7, I like this. Verse, why don't we go ahead and stand today? It says, in whom? Well, let me back up to verse number 6. Please, I know you're standing, but think with me for a minute. I didn't realize what verse 6 was saying. When it says, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. I should have. I always thought the beloved was the church. He's talking about Jesus Christ. He hath made us accepted in the beloved. And then it continues in verse number 7, and it says this about Jesus the beloved. It says, in whom we have redemption through his blood. Are you thankful for the blood of Jesus? Amen. If you're here today and you've never had him wash your sins away, you can have your sins washed away before this service is over. 
If you're here today and you got the Holy Ghost and been baptized in Jesus' name and you've, you've already had the blood applied, can I tell you the blood is still flowing in this house. 1 John 1 talks about if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And then it says, I love this verse, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. It's saying there's an ongoing washing. Woo! You know, as I'm teaching, there's a washing going on. The Bible says we're washed with the water of the word. There is a sprinkling in water and blood and spirit right now by the word of God. When you live for God, it's like there is an ongoing flow. Doesn't mean we don't have to repent. It means we got to repent and confess our sins. But I just, I don't understand it all. I'm just here to tell you. There's a flow from Calvary. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Are you glad you've been washed today? Anybody glad for the Holy Ghost today? Anybody glad you've been baptized in the name of Jesus? Why don't we lift our hands and thank God for the blessings, spiritual blessings in Christ Jesus. Let's love him right now. I love you, Jesus.